just picking up kind of where we left off to kind of cover these basic math need to knows for nursing that you're going to have to know. Military time, recapping, simple ways really is that <clears throat> pretty much if you take in the 12 hour clock, the AM, PM, right? If it's afternoon, so after 12 o'clock PM, right when the you know, sun's as high as it gets at noon, after that, so 1 PM, 2 PM, anything afternoon, you just add 12 hours to it. So if it's 1 PM, I add 12, now it's 13, and I get rid of my colon PM, I don't need that, then it's, now it's just 1300, 1400, 15, and so on and so forth, all the way until you get to midnight, which would be technically, some people will call midnight 2400. Most people will say uh, 0 hundred hours because it's the start of the next day and the start of the morning. And then everything after that is just take my whatever, you know, 1 a.m. and just make it 0100, 0200, 0300. Some people learn by just counting. You know, you think 12 and then I, 12 o'clock, I just count 13, 14, 15, 16. Um, it's kind of wherever you get there. I do advise it to make a kind of a habit, not that you don't have to be like me and kind of think in military time, but it's something you want to be able to know off the top of your head. Um, it makes life easier in healthcare, I think, just so you're on that same page. If you ever work nights, you know that the hours can be a little bit wacky. I don't even remember what this slot is. Oh, yeah. So if you're participating in WooClap, you can kind of do this. Let's convert a weird time, 8.45 p.m., Let's change that to military time. I'm going to let some people give their answers before we shout them out. So somebody, somebody's already got 2045 up there. Fast, on the trigger. Watch, everybody's going to. Not 2045 p.m. P.m. marker goes away. Yeah, so correct. It would be 2045. The 2000 hour is 8, and you can see that. By this, right? 8 p.m., if I add 12 hours, 12 plus 8 is 20, right? Or again, if I want to get to 8, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I didn't count really right, but. So 8 o'clock p.m. is 20 hundred hours, and 8.45 p.m. would be 20.45. Okay. Do another one. I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to remember what I had in here. All right, 12.30 a.m. to military time. 12.30 a.m. So just after midnight. What does that look like in military time? Somebody's got oh, 0.30 hours. I think they would say it that way. 0.30 hours, probably. Depends. You military guys and gals will say it somewhere other than that. It's, yeah, 0.30. This one is correct. It would be 0.0.30. Because midnight is basically 0.00 hours, just a four zeros. That's it. No PM, no AM, no colon, nothing. Um, and so again, it just kind of starts at midnight at zero. And again, you're just kind of counting the 24 hours that are in a day, really. If you want to look at it that way, you're just counting. Um, the add 12 afternoon is just to kind of help get you there faster if you need to. Um, but that's all you're really doing is counting, okay? So this is on that basic math need to know. This is nothing I'm going to test you over on unit one necessarily, but I always introduce this stuff early because I'm going to start early with these things. Um, and pretty much by the time we get ready for the unit two test, I'm going to expect that you have these memorized, honestly. That's where I'm going to be and then going forward because these are going to be vital things, vital conversions. And what I mean by conversion is that we're talking about household measurements typically or we're talking about Imperial measurements, imperial being like what I joke about calling freedom units, what the U.S. uses, pounds, ounces, stuff like that, inches. Those things are all imperial units of measurement, and we're one of the only countries that uses them in the whole world. And so that's why medications and stuff is always going to be in the metric system, in these grams and milligrams and liters and milliliters and stuff like that, um, because that's universal across the world. And then, you know, ironically, there's not really any medicines that are made in America, if you ever thought that. I mean, there's not a lot made in America, but medicines definitely not. They're packaged and shipped in, in Indonesia, China, places in Canada, some, Ireland. They're kind of all over the place. So, 
So conversion wise, these are just something you memorization. So I always preach these the first couple of days of like, these are coming, you know, like the storm is coming. Okay. <laughs> the storm is coming where these are going to be something I start testing you over. I'm going to expect that you kind of have these down. So my goal is by the time you get out of this class that these are kind of second nature. And so when you see some of these measurements, you don't have to think too hard. It's already just ingrained in you. So a teaspoon, right? We've seen a teaspoon at home, right? Like we measure a teaspoon, maybe, no? No bakers in here? Are you making, no, no cupcake making? Okay, all right. Yeah, you should, hey, you watch the Great British Baking Show, okay? It's good, and they have British accents, a lot of fun. All right. <laughs> My kids love the show on Netflix, Is It Cake? Look that one up, it's good. It's where they make cakes that look like real world objects. It's pretty fun, so the kids have a fun time guessing what's a cake or not, so. All right, so teaspoon, tablespoon, these are like household measurements, okay? And so a lot of times we will see these in medications, mainly in the form of liquid medicines, obviously, that you're gonna drink. And a lot of those would be some cough syrup, stuff like that, but all, most of the kids' medicines Kids, child's Tylenol, child's ibuprofen, right? That's all liquid. And sometimes they'll have directions that are in teaspoons, sometimes that sort of stuff. So there are occurrences where you have to kind of deal with teaspoons and tablespoons. Not always, a lot of the work is done for you in modern day stuff, but it's just something you should know. It's one of those things where nursing, a lot of stuff is done for us these days. We have computers, we have this, but we have to teach you everything without these, we have to teach you everything so we cover you when there are no assists, right? When you're somewhere and the power goes off and you're, or you're working somewhere where there's a hurricane and you're taking care of a bunch of people, you need to be able to do some math on the fly on a pen and paper. You need to be able to figure some stuff out on your own and you can't do that if you have no like foundational memorization or foundational knowledge, right? So, and I say that like, I mean, I worked in the hospital for 10 years. There's been a few times where we had computer outages. We had system failures. We had stuff where we were doing things the old school way, paper charting and figuring it out. And of course, people that were slightly younger than me, only been a nurse a couple of years, that was just like, that was the end of the world for them. And I'm like, this is great. I was like, I grew up in the transition. Like when I, when I got to my hospital, they were transitioning from paper charting to electronic charting. So I got to kind of see the transition. Um, so those are things that just, there's some stuff that's just foundational that you can't lose, right? So teaspoon, I always remember a teaspoon, like, like Sunday tea, okay, maybe this is because I have four girls, but if you have a tea party, what do you do? You get a little tiny cup, you put your pinky out, right? So a teaspoon is teeny tiny. That's how I always remember, a teaspoon is the smaller of the two. Oh wait, I need to change this to white probably, yeah. I always remember a teaspoon is the smaller of the two because when you're having, you know, whatever, Sunday tea with the kiddos, okay, a teaspoon is teeny, I guess teeny is like this, I don't know, teeny tiny, I don't know. Maybe it's two E's. It'd be two E's, wouldn't it? Teeny tiny? I don't know. You, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Whatever. We get it, right? Teeny tiny. So that's the smaller of the measurements. So a teaspoon converts to five milliliters, which if you've ever seen five milliliters, it's not much. On a medicine cup, that's one of the lower measurements on a medicine cup, usually the bottom line. So five milliliters is not much. Um, it's just a little tiny gulp. The bigger of those two household measurements is a tablespoon. Tablespoon is the bigger one. That's equal to 15 milliliters, which I hope that you can look at that and go, well, I know that 15 is what? Three times as big as five? Five times 15? I mean, if you don't know your multiplication tables, I've got one of those in D2L for you too, okay? You wanna get refreshed on multiplication tables? If they don't teach that in school anymore, I don't know, but they should. Um, so we see that a tablespoon is the bigger one, and I always remember that because a tablespoon is like for your table. This is a bad table drawing, but whatever, there's a table. Tablespoon is for the table for soup and whatever, okay? So it's going to be bigger than a teeny tiny teaspoon for your little tea time, right? So tablespoon is 50 milliliters, teaspoon is five, and that makes a tablespoon, what, yeah, three times as big, okay? Um, there are some shorthands for those when people write them out. A lowercase t would be teaspoon, uppercase t, tablespoon, or people, or the other abbreviation for them is 
TSP for teaspoon, TBSP for table, TB as in tablespoon. So, and again, I'm going over these now just to get them in your head, but I'm not stressing you out on the first test that these are going to be like all over the place. They're not. But by the time we get to the unit two test, I tell people that these and the metric system is something we've got to get down because I'm going to start throwing them at you. Um, and I'm going to keep throwing them at you the rest of the time. Uh, one ounce. Most of you have seen that. Does anyone have a soda or a water bottle in front of them? Something that has like ounces. How many ounces in that water bottle? 16.9. Look, does it have in parentheses milliliters next to it? 500. Okay. So you see that they all have those measurements. They've got us American Freedom Unit measurements and other, some other countries, and then they have the universal metric system measurement. So again, everything we chart is going to be pretty much in the metric system because that's how medicines are. Typically, most facilities, it depends, not all of them, most hospitals and stuff do things in kilograms for weight and other stuff. So all that stuff leans into the metric system. So one ounce for us, a fluid ounce, is equivalent to around... 30 milliliters. Now, why did I say around? Okay. Some of these, if you Google them, if you want the exact conversion, if you Google that right now, it's going to tell you that one ounce is equal to two point, I think it's nine six, or I mean, excuse me, not two point nine, twenty nine point like six repeating milliliters. Okay. Why are we not doing it exactly? We're talking about six 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 repeating. If I round that up. 29.66 repeating, that equals 30 milliliters. So a lot of stuff in nursing and in medicine, we've just taken it and said, we're so close, we're gonna round up and make it an even number for memorization purposes. That's one of those. It's just an even keel, 30 milliliters. And you notice that I put another one on here that 30 milliliters is equal to two tablespoons because one tablespoon is 15, 15 plus 15, 30. So. That's some of the things. A cup, a cup is kind of in going back into household measurements. Most of us use a cup for like cooking and that sort of stuff or whatever. Um, a cup is equal to 240 milliliters, which is equal to eight ounces. But see, here's the thing. You can kind of do the baseline, right? I could figure out how much a cup is worth if I didn't know the milliliters, if I knew how many ounces it was worth. Because I know this up top. I know that one ounce, if I know that, then I can figure out a lot. You see the baseline? I can figure out a lot after that. If I know that one ounce is equal to that, I just maybe got to know how many milliliters is in a cup, or I got to know how many ounces. But it's all about knowing a ratio. So what I just wrote right here, when we get into it, which we will today, this is, the, this is your introduction to a ratio. And all a ratio says is that, is this. If I have one ounce, that is equal to 30 milliliters. If I have one teaspoon, that is equal to five milliliters. A ratio just tells you I have this much, it's equivalent to this much, okay? And then from there, you can figure a lot of stuff out past that. You can figure out, again, if I know this ratio, then you can throw however many ounces at me. All I gotta do is take whatever those ounces are Multiplying by that. That's it. That's all I got to do. So that's like your little introduction to kind of ratio as we'll get into it. Some. Uh, some of the other ones are pure. Some of these are just pure memorization. Like you just have to know them. For example, one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds. There's not really like any math involved there except for that is just the memorization conversion. So all that says is again, but that still is a ratio. That's saying for every kilogram I have, I have 2.2 pounds. Every time I get to 2.2 pounds, I'm equivalent to a kilogram. So just like anything, if I weigh someone on a scale and they only have pounds, well, I can figure out how many kilograms they are because I know the ratio is 1 to 2.2. And so that would be either dividing or multiplying, depending on which way I'm going. And that's a lot of what converting is anyway. But that one's just pure memorization. There's no real, you just have to know that baseline, and then you can work from it from there. So one kilogram, 2.2 pounds. And some of you may have to do that in the hospital. If your beds only weigh in kilograms and you're wanting to chart pounds or vice versa to figure it out, because we think in pounds, we think in Fahrenheit temperature, right? Um, that sort of stuff. Most of the world thinks in the metric system, thinks in Celsius temperature, that sort of stuff, which 
in fairness, I like the metric system, but I can't get behind the Celsius temperature thing. I can't, I can't figure that one out. That one is, uh, there's not enough numbers for that one, but that one is easy because freezing is zero Celsius, so I guess that's easier, but. One inch is the 2.5 centimeters. Centimeters, again, is another metric system measurement for length. That's not a common one we're gonna deal with, um, but where do you think as a nurse, we might deal with length of something. There you go. There you go. Someone, wound care. Wound care. Knowing how big a wound is, how deep a wound is, its dimensions, that sort of stuff. If you ever get into wound care, that's going to really matter. Because, um, I mean, that's a lot of knowing the dimensions of a wound kind of tells us, is it getting worse, right? Is it getting better? You know, you have to have some kind of baseline foundation to know if it's getting better or worse. Is it healing? Is it getting deeper, you know, that kind of stuff, not just how it looks or smells, all right? I mean, wounds smell, too, if you didn't know that. I'm sure some of you do, but they smell, um, just like anything. <clears throat> but that's why we do it. Now, I wrote in parentheses, not 2.54 centimeters. This is just like the ounces thing, where if I did the exact conversion up to the mathematical decimal point, it would be 2.54. If you Google one inch converted to centimeters, it's going to tell you 2.54. Commonly in nursing and in any math in the medical field in general, we just round that down to 2.5. Why? Because it's really hard to keep up with a wound up to the hundredth of a decimal place, really. So it's a lot easier to keep this conversion there and makes it a lot simpler. And again, it's one of those things where the medical profession has just made the call to say, hey, let's just round this down, make it more concise, more to the point. So it's never, for me, one inch is never going to be 2.54 centimeters. It's always going to be 2.5, okay? No matter what you Google, all right? And then one pound is 16 ounces. That's a conversion still in that imperial system, but sometimes you may have to do that if you're trying to figure out foods or you're trying to figure out certain stuff there might be a potentially time <clears throat> where you need to do pounds to ounces and that's memorization and this one's a little bit of an odd one but some of you who worked in healthcare a long time may have heard of cc's before has anyone heard of a cc before yeah some people i actually still say it on accident sometimes because the nurses that trained me when i was starting out still said this sir for a long time it wasn't in milliliters most syringes were all measured in cc's which is cubic centimeter still in the metric system it was just a different way of measuring volume how much space something takes up in a syringe but it's basically equivalent equivalent uh, equivalent to a milliliter and so whenever someone says cc's they mean you know milliliter and you've probably seen some of the older movies or something like or a medical movie or whatever they're like give me two cc's of what blah, blah blah you know that sort of stat okay and I'm like, by the way, in an emergency situation, nobody says stat. <laughs> Why do they need to? The guy or gal is dying. No one, need, no one needs to know the urgency of the situation. No one needs to yell stat. No one does that. I've, I've been in several codes, and no one just yelled stat. <laughs> like, it's implied, okay? <laughs> it's implied. Because the joke, too, that I got trained when I did ACLS, the joke was always made that, in the conversation in nursing school was if someone's coding, meaning like they're in cardiac arrest and you're doing compressions, how fast do you push medicines through their IV? Slam it. They're not getting any deader. That's, I mean, it is. What, what point does it have being ginger on their veins? They're dead. We're trying to bring them back to life. So whatever medicine you're giving, slam it in there and move on. But that's how I was taught in ACLS. So it's that same kind of concept where it's like, it doesn't really matter. It's not one of those things that if you have a doctor, someone says CCs, it's just a one-to-one. -one. So don't get confused. It's just an old school way of measuring stuff before they kind of had this big discussion in the medical field. Like, let's just go universally to milliliters because cubic centimeters is confusing and, and whatever. I don't know what the exact reasoning was. But, so we don't use CCs anymore where you say milliliters, but if you ever hear someone like me accidentally say CCs or someone that's been nursed for a while or a doctor, they, it means the same thing. It's exactly one-to-one, -one, so you don't have to worry. So there's my big exposition on this. That chart in your, <clears throat> in your, um, uh, in D2, uh, D2L is not going anywhere, so keep up with it. 
This is another one I do like, and I will say, I will ask a couple questions about some of these on that quiz next week. Not because they're in the book, but because we need to know some of these. And you're going to see some of these in your medication problems. I'm going to use these in the medication problems to help direct you. So these are the ones I pulled out of. Like I said, I told you guys the first day. In your book, it, ha it does have a giant chart. The very first thing you turn to, like the very first page on the appendixes, a giant chart of medical abbreviations. You wouldn't have to know all these, but it is a good reference when you start seeing some. I tried to pull out the ones that we would possibly see in this class to start with. And so the quiz I do first, ask you about a couple of these, but overall I'm not going to keep testing you on these. I'm just going to throw them into questions as we go, as we practice medication dosage calculation questions. I'm going to throw them in there and say, hey, I'm going to assume that you've looked at these, assume you've started to memorize these, that sort of stuff. And when we practice, these will get, you'll see, they'll get, you'll get used to them, okay? So... Basically, I've just summarized out of all those ones in, that, in your book, the main ones that are going to apply to here. So we talk about routes and frequency. Route means how someone takes the medicine. It's something that we're going to be exposed to in this class. Obviously, we're talking about medication calculation problems. So they're all going to have some wording about how the patient takes their medicine. For the most part, I'm trying to focus on the math here, so I'm not always focusing on this for you guys. But... Again, it's one of those things that's a very hard need to know slash nice to know for your future. This needs to be something that is you're comfortable with. So some of these you might have heard of. PO is an abbreviation that stands for like oral or by mouth. Okay. PO. Again, these I didn't make these up, so don't get mad at me. Okay. <laughs> these have been this way for a long time. So PO means by mouth. And some of you that have worked in healthcare might have heard of this before or had to put this on someone's sign before they're going to have, or on their door before they're going to have surgery tomorrow. Nothing by mouth. Now you see that? So that makes sense that PO means by mouth or oral because NPO means don't give them nothing by their mouth because they got to have surgery tomorrow. And by the way, if you just want to know why that is, I mean, the biggest risk of why we don't let people eat or drink before surgery is that you want to have the stomach contents as empty as possible because if something happens their gag reflex gets triggered they could throw up if they have a bunch of stuff in their stomach they're going to be throwing up possibly into their lungs depending on how they're laying on a surgery table and that's aspiration that's choking to death or at best probably pneumonia so that's why they don't do that so most patients seem you have to and see that's an education point for people right what I tell most people is that whether you like it or not, if you want to be a nurse, you're going to be a teacher. Sorry, but that's what you're going to do. You're going to teach patients. You're going to teach their family. That's a lot of your role is to bridge the gap between their understanding, their common understanding or what they Googled um, <laughs> this day and age to like the actual understanding of what's happening and what's going on. So, so PO means by mouth. So now you can explain to someone why they're in PO. That means nothing by mouth. And you, you can tell them why so they don't throw up and aspirate it and choke to death while they're having surgery. If you tell them it that way, they'll understand. They'll say, oh, okay. I like being blunt, especially if they're a little bit of an a-hole. You know, you can really lay it on thick, okay? Hey, no one said there's anything illegal about that, all right? I treat patients how they treat other staff, usually. So, SUSP, usually it's a SUS. SUS usually stands for like suspension or an oral suspension. That just means an oral liquid. Like I mentioned before, the uh, oral liquids that you would do for common children medicines, um, your child's Tylenol, child's ibuprofen, all that stuff. That's SUSP, SUSP. SL or SUBL, um, Sublingual. Sublingual is a weird one that most people don't think about. It's a, only a few medicines out there. there. There are some. Sublingual basically means under the tongue is really how you would summarize it. Um, there's a couple medicines like that. One's called nitroglycerin. It's given to kind of help open up our cardiac arteries during usually a cardiac event or chest pain, some kind of heart attack. That's a common one. You don't have to know that at this point. I'm just kind of giving you context so you understand. But SU... BL or SL is sublingual, means it's going to be placed under someone's tongue. And the reason they do that is there's actually, our tongue is very vascular. So 
it can get to the, um, it's going to get in the bloodstream a lot faster and work a lot faster on our tongue or under our tongue actually than going like swallowing it traditionally. Because then it's got to get digested in the stomach and it's not going to get absorbed until it gets past the stomach. So it's going to take some time. Um, SUPP, everybody's favorite, a SUP, that's a suppository. Yay. And if you're sitting in this room thinking you'll never do a suppository on someone, that's real funny. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Unfortunately, we all will suffer this one fate one day. The older we get, the slower our bowels get. So we may all suffer this fate one day, but suppository means rectally, okay? Or it's a medication that's going to go in the rectum. Um, and that's commonly gonna be medicines to help with uh, constipation for the most part, but not always. There is a suppository that treats uh, bladder spasms. Um, because the bladder, the bladder wall is so close to the rectal, uh, or the, yeah, it's this bladder wall is so close to the rectum and anatomically that it'll actually help treat that. And so, I mean, if people have bad enough bladder, 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 blah, blah, I can't talk, bladder spasms, they would take, a spas whatever it would take, they'll do it. So, IMIV, we'll mention a decent amount in this class because we're going to talk about syringes a little bit and we're going to talk about liquid medications and how to kind of calculate them. So IM means intramuscular. That's your flu shot, your COVID vaccine. That's, that's all those. Most vaccines are going to be given intramuscular. Where do they usually do it? Shoulder, right? Your deltoid up here? Huh? Yeah, depo. Yeah, that one too. So anything that's going to be injection in the muscle is intramuscular. It usually goes by IM. And then the other one that most people hear is IV, which is intravenous, which means it had to be an injection into some kind of line, yeah, peripheral IV, a big, big catheter, pick lines, any central line, whatever is in the vein, that's intravenous. Both of those go hand in hand, they're similar. Um, th the difference is that some medications are manufactured in a way that makes them able to give intramuscular, intramuscular uh, muscles are very, 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 very vascular, full of blood supply, and so uh, muscular is going to be faster than taking a pill, but the fastest would be intravenous because it's directly into the vein, which means it's going to get pumped around the heart. It's going to start having an effect pretty immediately. So those two are all more fast acting. And then SQ or SUBQ is sub-Q is how I say that, how most people say that. Sub-Q is subcutaneous, okay? And you haven't had all anatomy stuff yet, but subcutaneous, our, our skin is called a cutaneous membrane. So basically this is sub, what's sub? It's like below, right? Submissive, below, subway, below. Subcutaneous is below the skin basically. So we're looking at into fat tissue. So a lot of subcutaneous injections, you may have seen these before. This would be things like insulin, anticoagulants like heparin, stuff like that. It's gonna be injected in the fat tissue. So a lot of people do the insulin injections to the stomach, maybe the fat in the back of the arm, that sort of stuff. And it's just, again, all those are just different. And th those three injections are all we really have as far as injectable. Well, okay, that's not all we have. You technically have intraosseous, which is into the bone, but uh, that's for emergency situations. And that's wild. You ever see someone jam one of them things in someone's bone? That's a lot of fun. I never got to jam one in myself, but probably for the better. They shouldn't let me poke too many things. But I recommend that as a nurse. I was all about doing stuff. Never done it before? Sure. T walk, tell me what to do. Let's poke somebody. Let's do it. Let's jam a needle somewhere. Unfortunately, you don't learn unless you do it, you know. There's no way. Yes. Cutaneous? Uh, like that's your name for your skin. Your skin is called a cutaneous membrane. So subcutaneous is saying I need to get below the skin level like into the tissue underneath. So mostly fat tissue is what you're looking for. Subcutaneous, everyone basically thinks of fat tissue. And so common places for that is your stomach, back of the arm, um, your leg could be there too. Um, but there's more muscle in your leg than there is fat, so it depends. Those are all the routes that you would kind of, like I said, there's technically IO, there's some other kind of routes we could highlight. But as far as any, any of the and I'm also doing this for you too. If you read the book and read through some of their practice questions, they're gonna use this. And not really is it gonna matter to you so much in this class, because I'm just trying to give you the foundation of the math, 
but you know it's there and I want you to understand them when you read them I don't want you just to read over them and just be like ah eh, whatever because it's now is the time this is a safe space here now is the time in this class to learn some of these so you don't have to think about it too much when you because you're not going to ever you're not going to stop having math in the program this is foundational you're just going to do more math in the program every term you're going to have something else kind of that you're learning onto it so if this sort of stuff starts becoming second nature to you, that's one less thing you have to uh, sacrifice brain power to think about, right? You can think about other stuff when you see math in the nursing program or on the NCLEX. You don't have to sit here and really think about this stuff. It becomes second nature. The other side of this slide is frequency. Frequency means how often someone's going to take a medication. And so there's some common ones here, too, that are going to be displayed in our chart. And like I said, I'm probably going to take a couple of these on the quiz next week, it's just 10 questions. I'm going to take a couple of these and throw them at you and see if you got any of them. So this is kind of like a, I should look at this sometime the next week. So stat, like I said, nobody really ever says stat, but this means immediately, at once, do it now. Um, I don't know. For some reason, people saying stat, the times I have heard someone say it, it just feels pretentious, like they're trying to, like they're on. I'm like, where are the cameras at? Like, we're all here. We know it's an emergency. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, most of the time you'll see stat in orders for imaging, for whatever. Um, or for a while there, when I worked at one of the facilities I worked at, they used to do order sets for cardiology, like, hey, do all this stuff for a cardiac patient, and all of it would just come in stat. And I'm like, I'm not wrapping their legs in SED stat. Like, I just, this is stupid. Anyway, so. Oh. Did she just have a lisp, maybe? <laughs> yeah, so stat means immediately or once. Again, most of the time you're going to see that in orders. You're not going to hear people say that out loud pretentiously because when it becomes that situation, most people are assuming, you know, again, if we're doing chest compressions, everything we're trying, everything the doctor yells to do is pretty much do it immediately or as fast as you possibly can. Um, and then as a nurse, you learn priorities over stuff like that. Uh, once a day or daily, typically they, they, um, they write this one out. They don't use something like QD, um, is not recommended by the Joint Commission. So the Joint Commission has a recommendation, and that's what the, this book is following, the recommended abbreviations on that first page as well. Um, so we're going to look at the Qs down here. Q basically is meaning like every, but they won't say something like Q daily or QD, something like that. Um, it leaves too much chance for confusion. And so the Joint Commission recommends that people write out once a day or they write out daily in the Word. Um, and you'll see nurses that do this. Some of us in doctors and nurses, we make up our own abbreviations sometimes. I'm still, I have done that before on accident, not accident, that's not accident, just because we can't think of something else. And you kind of meld all these together, but I'm trying to give you the basic ones. Um, but if you go into how many times frequency, how many times someone takes stuff a day, BID is twice daily or twice a day, which makes sense because bi means two, okay? Biannually is two times a year, whatever. Bi means two, so always remember, like bi meaning two, BID is bi daily, two times a day. TID, what do you think that one is? Three times a day, right? Try. Angle, tricycle, three wheels, three points. So tri is mean, or thrice, any of those, that T is like three times a day. Q, QID, quad daily, four times a day. So a quad bike is, you know, a four wheeler in Tennessee, right? Quad bike, four wheels. Quadruped, that's a four legged animal, walks on all fours. So quad is always four. I'm going to the quad, I don't even know what that means. It's, they used to say that in college, I don't know where the quad was, I don't know. I didn't know where anything was. I feel bad, I went to Belmont and never went to a basketball game, and that was the year we went, when I was there we went to the state championship and then got beat. We went beat at state, uh, <laughs> not the state championship, but we went to, we went to the, the, you know, the SEC tournament as like the last seed and then got nailed by Kentucky or North, one of those, you know, anyway. 
Everybody's like, we're gonna over, we're, we're gonna upset them. I'm like, no, we're not. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. But I feel bad. I never went to a basketball game. But you know why? Because I was in nursing school. Okay. I went to class. I went to clinicals. I went home. I studied. I did nothing else until Friday hit and I drank myself into a coma. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Drown my sorrows away. That was nursing school. Get ready. Um, <laughs> it was pretty rough. I would say that my bachelor's degree was the hardest thing I ever did until I just finished my master's. So, and that was just like a few months ago. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I didn't do a lot. So, anyway. The quad. I don't know what the quad is. I was in college, but I don't know what a quad is. But quad, I do know, is four. So quad, Q-I-D, is four times a day. And then some of the other stuff people will do, well, they'll order it, like, on an hourly basis. And so they use Q however many hours to say this, we do this frequency of this every this many hours. So Q two hours is saying do this every two hours. Q four hours is saying do this every four hours. Um, a lot, and then the last one there is PRN. It can be uppercase PRN. It can be lowercase PRN. Um, again, I don't know who came up with all these, but they've been this way for a long time. PRN means as needed or when necessary. And you should really stress that people a lot to people that take pain medicine, PRN. Say it's when you need it or when it's necessary, not every time you can have it. That's what I used to tell people all the time. Well, I need it every time I can have it. Well, you can call me. I didn't just bring pain medicine in, all right? You got to call for it. So that's PRN, that's as needed. Does those, those make sense? Um, yeah, like a lot of times pain medicines would be like Q4 hour or Q6 hours PRN, something like that. That'd be like a typical pain medicine order or something like that. And so that's saying that every six hours they can take the medicine as they need it if they need it in six hours they could take it that kind of thing and that's what those hourly means so those you'll see those in the hospital a lot you'll see those in the nursing home wherever you'll see that that's frequency so those are like the abbreviations i pulled out that we'll see on our questions in here i pulled out of that front page in the book basically and saying these are the most ones you're going to see right now for me and for this class um, and again, these are more just like, hey, these are here, and they're not going anywhere. Um, I don't remember what I had next. Oh, Roman numerals, you'll love this. You won't, you won't love it, but let me get this bigger. Mm. I've got this chart in D2L, or this, this, this document. Um, it's one of these, you're, I, get, and I told you guys, you're kind of in a little bit of transition. I'm anticipating I can fully get rid of this soon, but... I do want to mention it at this point. I can tell you that I'm really not. The first test, I'll probably give you a couple questions on a Roman numeral, and that's it, and I won't touch it again. That's the honest truth, okay? The honest truth is you won't see Roman numerals on your final anything, okay? That's the honest truth. But I do feel like I still have to touch on them because I have not gotten total confirmation that it's not possible for people to see them down the road in any of nursing material, okay? so. Again, you're in the transition period. Maybe by next semester I can finally get some confirmation from the Board of Nursing that there's no reason to teach it anymore, and I won't tell you about it. But I feel like I still need to, okay? Um, darn the Romans. All right, so um, typically these were reserved with a lot of the fraction stuff and a lot of what I call apothecary measurements. Have anyone seen a sign for an apothecary before? You know what I'm talking about? Do you know that word at all? Maybe not. You've probably heard it. Apothecary is like, basically think of it as an old school pharmacy and that sort of like mortar, like mortar and pestle and like grinding herbs up and stuff like that. Not necessarily, but it's much more like holistic, um, homeopathic medicine. And a lot of some of their measurements, if we're converting medicine in that world, we're using things like grains and we're using weight-based measurements and Roman numerals were involved. And eh. so overall, there's just like, that still lingers. That's just not as popular as it obviously once was, but it still lingers. So this, sh this sheet for Roman numerals has some stuff to let you know what things are. And so Roman numerals are wacky, but basically every big number here is going to have like a symbol that's associated with it. So like everybody pretty much knows number one. Number one can be, usually it's an uppercase. Oh, it's still white or like an off-white. 
Usually a one will be like an uppercase I, but it can be uh, a lowercase I can be a one, either one, which gets confusing. But usually an I is referring to one. This one I've never really seen anywhere, but apparently an SS with a dot over it is one half. That's what they're showing you here. I mean, sure. <laughs> But the common ones I think most people would ever possibly see is really like a Roman numeral for one. You might see, you're going to see probably a Roman numeral for five, which is just V. That's a five. This is a one, one half. I'm writing them bigger so you can see a little better. <clears throat> and then you might see an X, which is Roman numeral 10. And the other ones you'll only see probably every year at the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> So if you learn this sheet, you can figure out what number of Super Bowl we are next year by looking at the Roman numerals and impress your friends. I don't think they'll be impressed, but you can try. Um, that's about the only place I can anticipate you seeing it. And maybe I'm totally misreading the room on that one, but I don't think so. I don't think you're going to find much. So given that, that's kind of your basic one. Again, it goes up higher. They had ways of counting. When you got to 50, that was an L. When you got to C, that was 100, D was like uh, 500, 1,000 would be an M. It's like, ah, eh, we're getting in the weeds. So the, we the reason that they suck is just mainly their rules, okay? Um, so it says basically when a letter is repeated, its value is repeated, okay? So for example, like I have here, if I just did XX, its value is repeated. So that's 10 plus 10 equals 20, right? So because these are both worth 10, it's basically looking like this, right? So XX is 20. So triple X is 30, right? Or Vin Diesel, one of the two. Someone got that joke? You remember that movie you did, triple X? I think, I think Ice Cube did this, another one with it. Anyway, whatever. It was a movie. So that is... That, but why did I stop at the triple X's? So we'll get to that. We'll come back to that. So the weird rules are here. They get confusing here. When a letter follows a letter of greater value, its value is added. Okay. So what they're saying here is basically, I have a V. That's worth five, right? We established that. Behind that, I have an I. We know that's worth one. This letter is lesser value, okay? Uh, or, uh, well, yeah, I should say it the other way. The V is a greater value, right? So this is worth five. This is worth one. This is lesser value than what came before it, basically. So whatever is behind this V, if it's the same as the V, I'm just going to add them together. If it was a bigger number than the V, it's going to change what I do. But it's a lesser number. It's a smaller, it's a letter that represents a smaller number, okay? And so I add them together. And that gets me six. And then I can continue seven. I can add another one, eight. Now, why do I keep stopping with this? Because of this rule down here, uh, you cannot repeat. You can't, you can't repeat more than the same letter three times in, in, a, set, in a succession. So, like, basically, I can't do VII. That's what, five, right? with letters behind it that are lesser value, so plus one, plus one, plus one, that equals eight, but I can't do this to get to nine, because I cannot repeat, more than three times. I can't repeat more than three times, so I have to come up with another way to do nine, those freaking Romans, okay? And so that's where that weirdness comes in, this other rule is that if a letter precedes a letter of greater value, its value is subtracted from it. So if I wanna to get to nine, I put a nice little one in front of something of greater value. This is worth one, this is worth 10, but because this one comes before something that has a greater value, it subtracts. So one, 10 minus one is nine. That's why they're doing that. And so that's why this is, VI is six, but if I do this, what's that? Four. Four, because there's a one that comes before a five, which means there's a smaller number coming before, preceding a lesser value or a, a greater value number, and so it's subtraction. 
and that's how they get these odd numbers because you can't repeat anything more than three times. So obviously like an eye, two eyes, three eyes, hey, that's three. But to get to four, I can't get there because I can't repeat the eye multiple times, more than three times. That sucks, doesn't it? Does your brain hurt now? Yeah, I just feel like I don't understand the um, rights of three times in a session meeting. I don't know where from five to nine. Is that still equal to each other or no? The B, I, I, I. So, yeah, so we'll go back to that, yeah. So, basically, if you're counting, you're like, okay, V is five. Cool, I got that. I is one. That's fine. I put three I's. Cool. That's eight, right? Three plus five, eight. That's easy. The problem is I can't put another I here to get to nine because I cannot repeat more than three. The rule is for Roman, and that's just the Roman numeral, so I didn't make that rule up, but I can't re repeat more than three of the same symbol in a row. So this is four symbols in a row. I can't do this. So the only way to get to nine is to do it another way. I can't just keep repeating ones. So to get to a nine, I'm going to have to put a 10 here and because my rule is if I put anything of lesser value in front of it like a 1 I don't know why I put a 10 I meant this that's basically saying I put a 1 which is small in front of something that's bigger the rule is I subtract that from that number and that gives me 9 that's just I don't know that's just a rule that's why it makes like 19 is confusing as well stuff like that like 15 for example okay so that's 10, right? X is 10. Okay. How do I want to get to 15? Okay, simple. All right. Now I go somewhere else. I can go, I can go 6 or 16, excuse me, 17, 18, but now I'm stuck. So I can do XVII, which is basically saying 10 plus 5 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Let me make the 1 bigger. But now I'm stuck because I cannot repeat this symbol more than three times. So I have to get to, if I want to get to 19, I got to do it a different way. Which is the, <laughs> is the crux. So this document, there's a couple different ways you can actually get to 19. Um, one of them is basically saying X. Because basically what you're doing is 10. And then there's a 1 in front of another 10, which means that if I look at these two by themselves, 1 minus 9 equals 19. So xix is equal to 19, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. I knew you people were going to hate that. I, I hate it. But. This what? I don't even know what that is. Uh, it's like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not really. Not necessarily. I think that the 19 is a weird one. You could get there otherwise. Like, how did you know to subtract first rather than add? The only reason I'm going with that is because the I became, came before the X. So how I understood it reading about it is basically... They just, whatever the first letter was, was going to be there. And then after that, you'd make a decision. If it's a group of three letters or more, that first letter is going to probably stay by itself. You're not going to be affected. You're going to look at everything after the first letter, basically. If it's three or more letters repeated, or not repeated. They're not repeated, excuse me. Three or more letters in, in a row. In this case, we got up to three different letters. I'm just going to look at the last two and decide what's before, what's after. So something like after 19, it gets a little bit more simple, simply, simpler. That's not right, the word. But basically, if I just look at it as a whole, I can kind of say, well, X is 10, that's 20. I can get to 30, but what if I wanted like 26? Well, then I'm gonna have to do this, this. 20, so that's 10 plus 10. This is different. This is like a different section. So I'm looking at this as an individual section because I have repeating symbols. And I just let them stay until I get to something different. In this case, I had one symbol and then I had something different. And so I'm looking at that is how I read it, basically. V, VI is there's a lesser number after a bigger number. And so that's 5 plus 1, which means I'm going to be, this is 26.
Correct. Yeah. If I flip these the other way, it'd be IV, which means a lesser letter before a greater letter. That would be 24 now. Huh? It wouldn't be what? No. Minus what? The 20? Or... No, it's the other way around. If I have a, yeah, it is minus. It's five minus one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, I see what you're asking now. If a yeah, smaller number in front of a bigger number, I'm subtracting that smaller number from the bigger number. If I put a smaller, again, number, I'm saying number loosely, like letter. A smaller value letter behind something that is bigger than they get added together. And pretty much you can just repeat, yes. No, it doesn't matter because technically one could be three different things. One could be a lowercase i, uppercase i, or a T with a dot over it for whatever freaking reason. Um, it could be, yeah. From, so that's, that 19 is a bad one because I've been confused on 19 for a couple of years, honestly. But from what I can gather, yes, you could theoretically make 19. You could do IXX, and it should be, right, lesser value in front of that. So that's 10 minus, like, IXX would be basically. But there's some, there, I read there's some kind of rule with, like, you have to start with the bigger letter value. Something dumb that's, eh. But theoretically, in my mind, you could do this because this would be saying these two together, okay, that's just 10 minus 1, basically, because I put a lesser value in front of 10. And then this is 10. 10 minus 1 is 9, 9, 10. But there's something to do with that. This is like a lesser value in front of that, and it, it gets a little confusing. But theoretically, yes. The Romans didn't do a good job of making this very clear. I'll say that. And that might be the understatement of the year. Um, not going to be on the quiz. But on a person's hand. One, like one question. Okay. And I won't make it hard. I'll make it a, it's a, l l let me just say this. If you know what the I is, you know what the V is, and you know what the X is, you won't have any trouble figuring it out. Okay. okay. How about that? That's cool. You know what I represents, what V represents, and what X represents, you won't have any trouble figuring it out. Okay. Because I can't find anything that would be bigger than somewhere in the neighborhood of like 10 to 15 I something. No, you probably won't, no. You would only usually see those in apothecary settings, and that would only happen in, like, a rare instance where there's somebody who's getting a medicine that is related to, uh, I mean, I've only seen it once in my whole career. I mean, we'll be honest, only once. And it was, <laughs> I've only seen it once, and it was, um, I'm trying to remember the exact situation. It was basically like a shaman thing. Uh, it was a traditional. Okay, I don't know if they're a shaman. That might be, I might be culturally appropriating somebody. I'm not trying to. I just I didn't. I don't remember for sure. Um, but it was a, a traditional Hindu family from India. Didn't speak a lick of English, and there was this big rigmarole in the hospital, back and forth with like they're like again. I say I'm saying shaman. I'm not trying to culturally appropriate. I don't know what you would call that, um, but in the Hindu, um, some kind of religious f spiritual figure, and there was some kind of like ginger, ginger root, and this, there was all this stuff. And they went back and forth on it for weeks, and they finally ordered it, but it, because it was an apothecary measurement, it, it was a Roman numeral. And then, what, of course, what did all we have to do at the nurse's station? Yeah, I mean, we had to Google it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you that to be truthful, and that's why I don't focus on this. This is like, again, I'd rather just get rid of it, but... I was told to still mention it, basically, so we're here. But basically, I would stick with, for you guys, if, as long as you kind of have a vague memorance that if I see an uppercase or lowercase i something, then it's probably going to be, it's Roman numeral 1. If I see V, that's a Roman numeral 5, and X is 10. And if you can kind of get, if you can do the, if you can count 1 through 10 in Roman numeral, then you're fine, which is pretty straightforward. It's I, 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 all the way up to three, right? I, V, I in front of the V is four. V, I, six. V, I, 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 
and then it's going to be IX for 9 and X for 10. And then you kind of, if you can get that far, that covers everything. Oh, it's okay. If you get through all that stuff, then you're going to be fine. I can't imagine you're going to ever come across anything more complicated than that. So stay with me. I do need to talk about fractions a little bit. Your book spends a decent amount of time talking about fractions in chapter one. If you look, I'm not going anywhere in the book step by step or anything like that. Um, but the point I'm making with fractions is just a couple like reminders of things. Again, it's somewhat like Roman numerals where fractions are more and more associated with apothecary measurement. So I've been able to get rid of them for the most part from this. But I just always like to make a point of fractions as anything. I made this point, I think, the first day, too, is that fractions, just like anything, kind of represent a part of a whole. So it's the same thing as a decimal is representing parts of a whole number, okay? A um, percentage, right, is representing parts of a whole, okay? So this is 5 eighths here, but that's a... If you remember some of the fractions, the top number is called the numerator, the bottom number is called the denominator. Um, and with fractions, really all the point I'm making here is, again, parts of a whole. Um, what's my next slide? Numerator is the top number, the denominator is the same as a divisor. And so when you look at a fraction, what it really is, too, is it's when we do a division, right? What do we, how do we do a division? We do like, oh, what, well, you know, four, oops. You know, like, oh, we just do like 4 divided by 2 or whatever. We write it, we can write it like this, right? And so that's saying that we're trying to see, whatever, right, 4 divided by 2. We're trying to see how many times 2 goes into 4. But that's still kind of a fraction in a sense. So these are all related to each other. So I always think of the pizza example as like, if I had a pizza and it was, a, say, it's a personal pan with four slices, each of these four slices is one-fourth, meaning it's one slice of the four total I have. I know this sounds really dumb. Just stay with me. <laughs> Some people are like, this is the dumbest thing. But it's just kind of refreshing you on know, what the concept is. Well, okay, one-fourth in a decimal place, 0 0.25. So each of these is like 25 cents of a dollar. This is a quarter of the pizza. Also the same thing, 25%. Every, all three of those I just wrote to describe this one slice of pizza are all the same. They are equivalent. They are equal to each other. They're just different numeric ways of representing that. Okay. No one likes fractions, but again, they're just, just keep the concept. It's the same thing as, any, as a decimal or a percentage. They were representing parts of a whole. Okay. And so... When we talk about decimals, I focus more on decimals and remembering the value of decimals and the rounding of decimals because that's going to matter more to you uh, in medication calculation because when we do liquid medication, stuff is going to end up sometimes being a longer decimal number and we'll have to have some rounding to get where we want to be because you can't fit that small of a number in a syringe or whatever the case is. So every fraction basically means division of, okay, because it has a division bar. And so that's just saying that there is five slices of pizza out of eight. Five eighths is the same, basically. I've got five pieces out of eight. I'm looking at, can eight go into five evenly? No, I'm looking at what is the representation of this. And that's all the point I'm making is it represents part of a whole, okay? So... That's all I'm really going to say about fractions. We're not going to do the first section of the book. We're not going to add fractions. We're not going to change them to mixed numbers. I used to do all that stuff, and um, it was miserable for a lot of people and maybe fun for me, I guess, to watch people suffer. I don't know. Not really. Um, but no one likes fractions, and you don't necessarily need them at all for any reason. Again, fractions, Roman numerals, are kind of like the old guard of apothecary stuff that's very rarely seen. And so my focus for you guys is going to be just reminding you about decimals and their value and how to round them, and then a little bit about finding percentages, because I think that's just a basic thing that everyone in the world should know how to do. And it is relatable to nursing and healthcare because if you ever in your life, if you ever go further with this education, you're going to have to get into research and research papers and stuff, and all that is is a lot of statistical analysis, data sets. And you won't understand all of them. I have a master's degree, and I still have to refresh myself on data sets and stuff like that. So I'm not saying that, but you need to understand the value of a percentage and kind of what that represents, okay?
So again, if I eat one of this four slices of pizza, that's one fourth, it's 25%, it's 0.25, just like a quarter of the pizza. So that's my fraction discussion and what its value is as far as knowing what it is. So decimals. So the book starts talking about decimals. If you have your book with you, you can kind of get to that point. on page, It's in chapter one. It basically starts talking about that on page uh, 15 is where it talks about the value of decimals. And it does make the point that you could say a decimal is a fraction too, which you could. I don't, this book loves fractions, but think about it for a, a second, right? Okay. 0.25, or let's look at 25%, right? What are you saying with 25%? You're saying that you're a quarter of the way there, or that's worth a quarter of a whole, right? If that same scenario of a pizza, if I'm saying 25%, what I'm saying is if this is 25%, I'm saying basically 25 out of 100. That'd be the same thing with like 25 cents out of a dollar, right? The whole dollar. I'm saying there's 25 pennies to give me 25% of a dollar. It's all equivalent to each other. And again, it's a, just a way we use to represent parts of a whole. And so decimals, one thing it talks about is determining their value. And I think that's a good place to start because it just reminds us what decimal places are worth, that sort of stuff. So there's a decimal place chart um, on page 15, but kind of refreshing you. Um, if I just put like a random number up here, Let's, let's just do like 21 point, I don't know, one, two, five, I don't know, six, something like that, okay? So what that is saying is, if we're saying like pizzas again, there's like 21 pizzas, okay? And then there's point one, two, five, six of another pizza, that's what it's saying. If you look at, I always like, maybe I'm always hungry and thinking of pizza, but pizza always makes sense for like fractions and decimals and stuff to me. So that's basically saying, right, I have 21 things, whole things, in this case, 21 whole pizzas, and then I have a percentage or a small portion of the other one left. And it, in this case, it's 0.1256. So these are all the whole numbers this way. Maybe we'll, yeah, we'll just say, I'll leave it at 21. Whole numbers, like they're a whole pizza, and then everything after to the right of a decimal, right, is representing those slices of pizza, those chunks, those pieces of it, okay? pieces of a whole. Um, and so I'm not even really focused on the whole numbers, but I mean, basically whole numbers is like, that's tens place, single units, right? Hundreds place, thousands. I just go up from there till I get to, you know, trillions. Um, and, and by the way, if you, I think it takes like, if you wanted to count to the number, if you just want to sit here and count, to like 34 trillion, the number of dollars we're in debt as a country, it would take you like 60 years to count that high. If you just counted one dollar bills, anyway, put that in perspective. <laughs> I'm just saying, put that in perspective. So numbers go up infinitely. Decimals can go the other way infinitely too, but the book tells us, hey, it calls them decimal fractions because what they're saying is that, again, all a fraction percentage a decimal is representing is parts of a whole. So I got 21 whole pizzas, but I got this small little chunk. And so the way it goes is this first place after the decimal point, whoops, is the tens place. My writing sucks, I know. Hundreds, thousands, right? And I'm running out of room. Ten thousands place. And so, and it just continues, so on and so forth can kind of remind you of decimal places and then hundred thousands place and uh, millions place you know hundred millions place so on and so forth you just keep going <clears throat> and again you could use these as representing a fraction but what I think what they're talking about is comparing decimals you're looking at them from each place and you have to know where these places the value of them okay so is that refresh that's okay people that makes sense to you guys right? The decimal places. Tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, just continues on. Most of the time, we're never going to really work with anything in healthcare and nursing more really than the hundreds place. We may have to round from that thousands place, that third decimal place to the right there, but typically we're not messing with anything more than the tens or hundreds place, which is good. That's less stuff to worry about. 
typically. That's not what we're worried about. So, so when it, the example they give here is they're comparing, they're comparing decimals here down here at the bottom. So I always tell people, if you have to compare a decimal, if you're kind of trying to figure something out, you need to write them on top of each other so you can kind of get the gist of where their decimal is. And so they give us the two examples, 0.123 and 0 0.234. So if you're comparing them, you're kind of just looking, starting at the tenth place. You're starting at the first place you go, right? And you go from there. So, I mean, this one's pretty easy right off the bat. I look in the tens place, is two bigger than one? Yeah. Yes, okay, it's interactive, yes. All right, so very easily I already know, right, that this is, that 0.234 is a larger number numerically, a larger slice of pizza than 0.123. Will you agree with that? Okay, and so, um, whoops, you guys kind of remember the greater than or less than stuff, maybe? Somewhat. So if we're talking about greater than or less than this, I always remember it this way, basically. The greater than symbol is that little line sideways triangle, basically, without the bottom. And I look at it like it's Pac-Man. So if this side is greater than, Pac-Man always wants to eat more, okay? So I said 0.234 is greater than 0.123. So it means Pac-Man wants to go this way. See, look, it kind of looks like pac I mean, I think it looks like Pac-Man if you do like this. <laughs> I mean, it's a stretch, but. So what this is saying is the greater than or less than is how you read it. Oops. Is that if I read it from left to right, 0 0.123 is less than 0 0.234. If I read it the other way, 0 0.234 is greater than 1.8. The symbol always goes to eat the bigger number. Yum, yum, yum. Okay. So that's comparing them. But again, I put them on top of each other at first just so they'd line up, right? And you can do that the same way. So if I change uh, this number, now I made it 0 0.0134. Well, again, I looked at the tens place, they're both one. Okay, move on. I look at the hundreds place, which is this next one here, the hundreds place. 2 and 3, so now I see there's a 3, 3 is bigger than 2, so 1.134 is, is the greater decimal. Now, do it this way. Again, this is just a place to start with decimals. Uh, I'm changing it up. I'm trying to change it. I'm trying to give you an example. I'll just do this. this. This proves my point. Okay, if I said, hey, compare 0 0.103 to 0 0.01, and how do I know which one of those is greater? Well, again, I put them on top of each other so I can look. You look at the tenths place first. They're both 1. You look at the hundreds place. The top one's a 0, and the bottom one has nothing there. Well, what's there? Zero. A 0. There's nothing there. So with decimals, I can always add trailing zeros, zeros at the end to help line stuff up for me. So I can add as many zeros back here as I want to. This does not change the value of this decimal. It changes nothing, okay? This value, the decimal is the exact same no matter how many zeros. I can add zeros and all the way to the board in the next classroom. It wouldn't matter. It's still 0.1. But I do add zeros because it helps me look at this properly because now I can look at this and go 100%, or I shouldn't say percentages, I won't forget, but I can say without a shadow of a doubt that 0 0.103 is more than 0 0.1, right? When I look at it like just this chunk. Yeah. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Okay. So for decimals, trailing zeros is, a, is an okay thing. You can put trailing zeros, meaning zeros in behind on the right side of the decimal, Behind, if there's no number there, you can add those all day to help kind of keep your decimal straight. Okay, that's called a trailing zero. They don't affect the value of the decimal. They don't change it at all, okay? It's still zero. It's nothing. It's worth nothing. But all it may do is help write, line this up a little better sometime. If you're writing stuff out to help you think through stuff, I always recommend adding zeros in places just to help maybe line stuff up and make it easier, okay? 
Now, why do you think I'm making the point two to write the zeros in front of the decimal? What if I just left these off? Because there is nothing, right? And I just left, like how I say it sometimes, I'll say point this, point that. I just wrote it like that. Why do you think I'm deliberately, I'm writing the zeros in front of them for a reason? Any guesses? Does that look any more, does that look a little more confusing? Yes. Yeah, it does a little bit. So the Joint Commission who accredits healthcare organizations, most hospitals, that sort of stuff, they're the ones that kind of set the bar for recommendations on abbreviations and this and that. They recommend when writing decimals out, if you were doing like a written order, you need, you need, you not need, you have to put a leading zero, what I was doing, this. Because again, if I'm just writing that real quick and I have bad handwriting, you may look at that 0 0.104. If I didn't put the zero in front of it, that decimal place, you're not sure if that's a spec. Maybe I wrote it on accident. So for some, there's a big difference in the medicine if I was supposed to give 0 0.103 of something to 103 of something, right? <laughs> We're talking a, almost a 10,000 di difference there. So if ever writing stuff out, doctors, whoever would write stuff out, and I encourage you to make this a habit for yourself so you don't get yourself confused, you need to have leading zeros, which means put a zero in front of the decimal. If there's no number there, no whole number, you need to put a zero in front of it so there's no shadow of a doubt this is a decimal. And then trailing zeros, if you did a math problem and you had trailing zeros, they don't matter, but for visual, if you don't need them, then get rid of them, right? Like, I don't need all those, so I can get rid of them. I don't theoretically need this. doesn't change the value. Get rid of it. It's cleaner and it's less confusing. The trailing zeros, you can get rid of them if you need to. You can add them back to help you, but your final answer, just get rid of them, just so you don't make it confusing. And for any final answers, you want to have a leading zero to make it, again, less confusing. There's no chance for you to second guess that it's a decimal. I made that dot really big, but if I just wrote something real quick... That's a small dot. Is that 0.123 or is that an accidental Mr. Mawson can't write and he just put a dot, right? If I put a zero in front of it, there's no debate now. I know for sure that's a decimal place. Does that make sense right there? Okay. So the Joint Commission recommends, hey, get rid of your trailing zeros if you can. Get rid of those because they they're nothing. They don't matter. And your leading zero, zero in front of the decimal, if you need that there for a whole number, put it there so you don't get confused. So that's a big point for me when writing stuff, okay? So let's talk about rounding decimals, because that's kind of where I go after this. And that's page 16 in your book. So this is, I mean, this stuff sounds really simple. I know for some of you, you're like, you're tuning this out, and that's fine. I get that. But for some people, they haven't heard this in a long time. So it's just like, we got to kind of touch all the bases, right? So... Decimal places, you're looking, the way the book tells us and the way I would always recommend is calculating your decimal place beyond the desired place. What does that mean? So it depends. Remember, most problems, every problem I give you, and I've still got to update some stuff, so bear with me. But every problem I give you um, on homework or on an exam should say blatantly what the rounding principles are. Hey. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't even know those people are here today. It might only be an A and P. Oh, Alexis, you're here. Ha ha, gotcha. Miss Woodson, Donye, is it is it Don is it Donye? How do you say it? Donye, okay. I'll make sure. Got you. Yay. Yay. That sounds like a cool rapper name, right? <laughs> Yay. I always wanted to be the person that was like the hype man because that seemed like an easy job, you know? <laughs> There's a funny story. I, if you want to know a little bit about me, I went to Bonnaroo in 2012 and 2013. And I mean, I didn't just stop by. I stayed there like, the, like a real person, all right? like a real OG, okay? That's back when they just had Pora Johns. They didn't have nothing else, all right? You wanted to go, you know, bathroom in the morning because if you waited to the end of the day, mm-mm, bad time. Because they always emptied them about 6 a.m., so. Anyway, 
that was the that was the time. Saw Sir Elton John. Um, saw Sir Paul McCartney live. Anyway, uh, I saw Wu Tang Clan live, and the hype man came up and said, "What's my name?" And we're all like, "I don't know." <laughs> He's wanted to say Wu Tang Clan, but apparently, I don't know. A bunch of the Bonnaroo people were just like, "Huh?" Too high to realize it, I guess. I don't know. But that was always funny. I mean, he was a hype man. He was like, want us to yell Wu Tang Clan, but we didn't. We weren't tracking. We didn't get it. So <laughs> everyone's like, I don't know your name, dude. You know? Okay. All right. Calculate one decimal place beyond. So what it's saying is basically, whatever decimal I have, just look one place beyond. And then with rounding anything, it's the same principle no matter what you're rounding. It's basically. If that digit is four or less, it's going to round something down. If the digit is five or more, it's going to round it up to the next whole number. So how they're, what they're, this is just wording this, but let me show you in practice, right? Let's just make up a, let's make up a decimal. And again, I'm going to give you rounding principles on everything I do. And when I say with rounding principles, I say directions, right? Like round this, your final answer to the tens place. Round all your final answers of the next four questions to the hundreds place. Stuff like that, right? So let's do, uh, just throw some numbers at me. Throw some random numbers. Two, I heard two. Eight, seven, eight. Six, seven, eight. I'll stay there. All right, we'll stay there. So point, I always say that, zero point, but point two, six, seven, eight. If I said let's round to the tens place, okay? This is all my method is. I want to round to the tens place which means I want to get here, right? That's what I'm trying to round. So all you've got to do is take your eyeballs, come over here, this is my little drawing I do. Take your eyeballs to the place behind it. In this case, the hunter's place, it's a six. And then ask yourself one question. Is it a five or more or is it four or less? In this case, it's five or more, it's six. So all that does is mean it's going, this, because it's five or more, is going to change this to the next whole number up, which means a three. And then everything else goes bye-bye. You don't need the rest of it. It's all gone. You don't need it. Gone. That's it. That's your simple way of rounding everything. Just do it that way. You don't need nothing else, okay? Because it said rounded at tenths. And all I need to worry about is the tens place. And so I just get to the tens place, I'm done, okay? So that point two six seven eight, I think is what it was. If I said round it to a tens place, your final answer is 0 0.3. I'm done. Nothing else needs to be done here. So where's my next slide? <laughs> I shouldn't, should know this stuff. Yeah, okay, so. Determining the decimal place, basically, yeah, you're looking at some of these. So some examples the book has given us here. <clears throat> number, for example, 5.65. So the whole number for that is telling you, it, it's giving you examples if I was rounding. If I said round to the next whole number, then you just have to look at the tenths place, basically, right? So this one they're saying, hey, if I round to the whole number, it's a 5 here. I look at the, I just take my balls, excuse me, to the tenths place. Is it a five or more? Yes, it's a six. So that just, if I said round to the whole number, which is here, that changes this whole thing to six. And then they kind of show you the rest of it. 5.65, I said round to the nearest tenth. Again, same concept. I look where I want to go, and then I take my eyes directly next door to whatever's right next to it. In this case, it's a five, which rounds up. So now that's, that's 5.7. Nearest hundreds place? Look, their answer is the same as the original number, 5.65. Why? Because it's already at the hundreds place. There's nothing more for me to do. Does that make sense? Like if it's already there, I don't have to do anything. So for example, if you were doing a problem and I said, hey, round your answer to the hundreds place, your final answer to the hundreds place, okay? And you got 5.65, you're done. There's nothing else to do. You can't round it anymore. It's already in the hundreds place. There's nothing more you need to do to touch it, right? Does that make sense to you guys? I know that that's probably like, you've heard that a million times maybe, but just so in case we are on the same page here. Um, and then one thing I tell people too is that categorically guys, I, I'm good, these, I believe that my tests are pretty straightforward, but I will give you answer choices that, for example, let's look at 4.21 down here. Let's look at that one. 
Okay, let's look, let's look over here. <clears throat> if I said, hey, your final answer on this problem needs around to the tenths place, okay, and you got 4.21 as your final answer, right? Mm -hmm. And you left it. Guess what? It's wrong. Because what did I tell you to do? Round your final answer to the tens place. This is not round to the tens place. So it doesn't matter. It is wrong. You did not follow directions. I don't care if you got the right answer and just didn't round it. That's not the right answer then, okay? Again, that's the same thing like saying whatever. You can make up anything. It's like going to a restaurant and you're ordering a burger and they bring you a salad and say, well, I didn't order a burger. Well, it's close. It has lettuce, so... It's not the right, it's not what I ordered, right? It's the same difference, okay? You have to be exact with stuff. And the reason it matters to detail is that if this was a medication, who knows what medicine you're talking about? There are some medicines out there that if you're off by a tenth, that could be the difference between giving someone sedation and killing them. And it could be. You want to talk about fentanyl? Yes, fentanyl has got a lot of news, but fentanyl has been used in medications for putting people to sleep and sedation and pain relief for several decades before it ever became a problem on the streets. And how these kids are getting hold of fentanyl, I'll never know because, I mean, when I was a teenager, it was like trying to find someone to buy beer was hard enough. Anyway, so I, <laughs> I don't know where they get this stuff. Uh, I don't know. I not the circles I hung out with, I guess, but. So anyway, and that's a real problem. You don't think it is. Wait till you get in the program. We go to a clinical at the adolescent mental health facility, and we got 40 kids with dual diagnosis, and half of them are detoxing from fentanyl. And they're like 14, 15, 13. Tell me it's not a problem. That's in Kentucky. They serve Kentucky. That's one area of the country. All right, so it's a problem. So my point to that is saying, hey, there are medicines out there that are really potent, so it is going to matter. You can't say, well, I got the right answer. Nope, you didn't. You didn't round. So it doesn't matter. It's not the right answer. Is that fair? Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. And I mean, that's just math stuff all the time. That's how math's always treated. When I was in school, it was like, you got the, even if you got the right answer exactly, if I didn't do the way the teacher wanted me to do it, I was still wrong. <laughs> I'm not that strict, but there are nursing schools out there that are that strict. So, um, and we're not as of yet, but uh, be careful. Don't push us, I guess. I don't know what they'll do. You never know. I don't make those decisions, but that, I mean, when I was in school, that was the way. So, and you have to forgive me. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm good at math, but I did math in my head. I did common core math in my head before it was ever even taught. I didn't know what common core was. I did, that's how I do math. I do it in my head like that. So, I have a problem with showing work. So I'm not going to ever kind of, for me, I can't personally ever grade you guys on showing work. But with the homework stuff, I do ask that you do. And I won't necessarily count it wrong, but I ask that you do. Otherwise, I can't help you with it. Meaning that you could do the homework, turn it in, and have only the answers. And I'm going to give you credit for it. But I'm just going to say, good job. Wish you had shown your work. Because if you got something wrong, then I could tell you why you got it wrong. Or we could talk through it. But if I see no work, then I get it. So I understand as a teacher understand the value of being able to show work to show how people got to some answers um, and so for the homework I do ask that you make an attempt to show some kind of work because unit one homework is eh there's we're gonna be doing a lot of this stuff so you can't really show your work that's fair but as we go forward we're gonna work on developing a formula for you guys and so it is vital that you do show some work show me how you got there and I can tell you where you're missing a step or where you're making a wrong turn but if I don't have any work to go off I don't know what you're you're doing and I cannot stress enough that once we start talking about this that you hone in on a way of doing this and you stick with it because it will be so much more helpful. Some of you are like me where you have the ability to do math in your head enough that you can do very much. There's some people sitting in this class right now that I can guarantee you could probably do this, everything that's required of this class probably in their own head or with a calculator without really writing much down because it's not too bad. Um, but the writing down part gives you a setup to fall back on, a way to double check your answers, a way to when you get confused, have a method to plug in and it limits your ability to make mistakes. So, so that's rounding principles in a nutshell for decimals. Same thing, you're looking, whatever the directions say, nearest tenth, nearest hundredth, nearest thousandths, nearest whole number. Um, and all you gotta do is look where you wanna go 
and look at the number right behind it and decide, is that bigger than five or smaller than five? Bigger than five, I'm rounding up the number that I want to get to or I'm rounding down. Uh, Um, and so the book does make this point. Again, some of these slides are stolen from the book. And it's a good point to make. Some of, this is like a nursing principle, but something that I kind of touch on here. As, um, there's an exception to some rounding. So the, for the most part, I would say you're not going to be rounding medications to a whole number unless you really don't have a choice. I mean, for example, like if I did math and I had to give somebody a medicine that was like this, we'll just say it's that. Well, okay, <laughs> we're talking about a hundreds here. I can't really, I probably would get as close as I could, but it's probably going to end up being, what, one whole ML. You know what I mean? We're talking semantics, but typically, I can't round, if I got something like this, it, depending on what medicine it was, if I took this to the nearest whole number, that's a, Ten, that's a whole tenth of a difference. That might be enough to kind of be enough medicine to be toxic to their kidneys. It's possible. It depends on what it is, but it's possible. That comes later when you start realizing medicines, but your goal is to be as accurate as possible. You want to be as specific as possible, so you want to get as close to the doctor's order as possible. So what they're saying here is real far off. If I had 1.7, don't just jump that up to 2 mLs because it seems like it's easy to put in a syringe. That's a whole three-tenths difference, depending on what medicine it is. In this case, if that was morphine, I don't know what the dosage is of the morphine, but that could be the difference, 1.7 to 2. That could be the difference between 4 milligrams of morphine and almost 6, which depending on what you're giving, that could be the difference between granny having pain relief and granny not breathing, okay? <laughs> that's what pain medicine does, suppresses respiratory rate. So, you know, it's, you want to be as exact as you can. And you might hear some nurses talk about nursing doses and stuff like that, and that is a thing, and I will tell you stuff like that off the table, off the record, but that's always your discretion. You have to remember, once you have your license and you're working, you worked hard for that license, and everything falls back on you. So when you put your name on stuff or you're a part of stuff, I mean, it's your license on the line when it comes down to it. So don't do anything. I always tell people, don't make any decisions, do anything that you wouldn't throw your license away for. Meaning like, it's only worth doing if you're worth losing your license over it. So if it's something that you think is anything nefarious or it's cutting corners or something like that, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh... Oh, this, I forgot this slide was in here. See, I messed up. I read in this PowerPoint last week, so I didn't remember where stuff was. But yeah, always insert a zero in front of the decimal. That's your like leading zero, what I mentioned before. So you leave, limit confusion because um, it helps you kind of point your eye to that decimal place and limits your confusion. You, miss, miss, you, mi uh, you avoid missing the decimal. You avoid um, mistaking the decimal place for another number or something like that. And that's what they're showing you here. Put 0 0.58 instead of 0.58. Put 0 0.13 instead of 0.13. So that's that leading zero. Keep your leading zero so you're not making a mistake. And it says never use trailing zeros. And what it means in the final answer. Like I said, the trailing zero is saying you could add zeros to any decimal. It doesn't change the value at the end. If you need to kind of help make your, right, um, make it less confusion, okay, but what they're saying is like 5.0, right? There's no reason I need to have that trailing zero in 5.0 because that's just five, the whole number, right? If I write it like that, it does offer potential for confusion. It's all about limiting confusion. And again, a lot of this stuff is more in terms to like old school written orders and stuff like that. But it's just habits that you always want to be in. Because like if you're not in this habit, right, and randomly, maybe you write something down for a coworker to go give a medicine for you, right? Like, hey, oh, uh, Mr. Billy gets, you know, this much, and you write down 5.0. If they're in a hurry and you didn't verbally say it, if they look at that sticky note, they could very easily go 50 or not. So, again, that's a practical example. There are going to be times where you have to see some written orders. They happen, but it doesn't happen as often now. Everything's electronic for the most part. But you still want to be in good habits because... I've seen stuff like this happen, miscommunication mistakes from written stuff down because it was written down oddly and with confusion. This limits confusion. If I write just a five, it's just five, you know what I mean? 
instead of 1.00, it's one, you know, that kind of thing. So le trailing zeros, get rid of it. All right, here's your interactive part. We're gonna, this number, I'll write it bigger. Round 0 0.2756 to the nearest tenth. That's what I'm challenging you. Don't yell it out yet loud. To the nearest tenth. Somebody mistyped. There should be a decimal on your phone, shouldn't there? Am I crazy? Maybe it's just not showing it. Yeah, maybe it's not showing it. Huh. I don't know. Maybe I should change the view. I don't know. I'm messing around with this word cloud thing anyway. What does it do if I do a list? There we go. Okay. So the word cloud is just being weird. Huh? Oh, maybe it ran out of time. I don't know. Listen, it's not, per it's not perfect, okay? I'm not perfect, all right? <laughs> what was this? What happened here? I'm not giving you a hard time, whoever you are. I'm just saying, what happened? So, again, tens place, right? So, if I says round the nearest tens place, my eyes go to there first and say, this is where I want to go. Everything behind it, I only need to look at what's directly behind it. That's all I need to look at. Eyes go directly to what's behind it. It's a seven. What does that do? It rounds that two to a three, right? And then everything else goes away. So that seven changes this to a three. Everything else drops away. It's 0 0.3 would be your final answer. if That was the question got asked, okay? All right, do another one. I got a couple, I think. Let's see. It's like a surprise for all of us. Okay, we got another one. Round this number to the nearest hundredths place, and I'll write it bigger. 1.23. Five, five, five. It says round to the nearest hundredths place. Again, yeah, the word cloud seems to not want to show the decimal, which is interesting. I don't know. Why don't we do the grid again? I don't know. Don't just copy what everybody else is doing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. So it, it, we would agree it is one point. 2-4, right? We'd agree to that? Yeah. Okay. Well, again, I, w I put the 5-5-5 five, five, five at the end because that, that throws some people off. You get to overthinking it. Don't overthink it. Again, rule of thumb is, where do I want to go? I want to go, this is, again, tens places here, hundreds place, thousands place, so on and so forth. I want to get to the hundreds. I look what's behind it. Behind it's a 5. That makes the next number round up. Everything else behind that goes away. So this goes away, that changes that 3 to a 4, I'm done there, I'm done. Simple, easy breezy, right? All right, easy breezy, beautiful cover girl. You remember those commercials? <laughs> Which, is that Aveline? I don't know what that was. Mabel, or Abilene, I don't know what that is. That's a drink maybe. Ah, Maybelline, that's what it was. I miss commercials sometimes. I mean, it's nice not having them. I don't know who has younger kids, but my kids don't know what a commercial is still. I mean, they kind of do now. But I remember the first time they saw one, they were ticked. As we were at like grandma's house and then a commercial came on, they're like, turn the show back on. They're like about to fist fight somebody, you know what I mean? They get real aggressive. I'm like, I don't have control over it. It's a commercial. A what? It's like they're, tell, they're advertising stuff to you and like toys came on and then they're like, then they just forgot because they're like, well, buy that for me. I'm like, oh my gosh, spoiled. All right, so anyway. I just thought it was funny. I didn't have the realization that they didn't understand what a commercial was. That's really funny. Also, I find it funny that kids just tend to know how to use electronic devices out the womb. Like, why? How? I'm not kidding you. My twins could use a tablet like when they were before they could walk, I swear. Or they, they could find stuff on your, they could grab the phone and like they just knew how to like click on it and grab it and how to play with it. Where do they get that from? I don't know. I just, I'm mesmerized by that. No idea. All right, so most people are getting to the right conclusion, I think, here, right? Maybe. Is it a need to put the zero behind the eight? No. Okay. That would be, yeah, the zero behind the eight would be somewhat like the trailing zero thing, yeah. where it's just, 
extra fluff that um, can be confusing. And so I'd just leave it off. Oh, well, excuse me. Yeah, I mean, okay, let me, let me, let me preference that. Because it's, it's 0 0.799, right? So let me caveat that. You don't have to, you don't really need any leading zeros, okay? So some of you are getting to the right conclusion here. So let's just look at it, right? This was a, a diff difficult one for a reason. Not difficult necessarily, but different for a reason. I'm not going to write all these on there because it doesn't really mean anything, but 999. Nine, nine. Okay, so again, I said what's round to the nearest hundredths place, right? So all I'm going to do is look at the hundredths place, which is here. I look whatever's behind it. What's behind it? A 9, which means it's going to change that 9 that I want to get to. What's it going to change that 9 to, though? A 10, right? What's the next whole number after 9? 10. What does that do? That changes, if this is a 10 now, I can't put a 10 in one spot, in a single digit spot. Whoops. So what that does for me is that that means it is what you guys caught on to. It is going to affect this now. It's going to affect the 10s place. Whether I want it to or not, I can't put a 10 in a single digit slot. Because this 9 has changed this to a 10, I can't stay in the 100s place. I wish I could, but it's going to automatically make this go to an eight. Anytime I get to a 10 in one of these single digit lines, all these decimal places are single digits. It moves the next number, yep. These are all single digits, meaning they're worth like, it's either one through nine, that's all I can get there. I can't fit like a 10 in there. And so when I get a 10 or an 11 or whatever, I wouldn't go to 11, but when I round up to the 10, then I've got to change whatever's in front of it. So it does, it automatically changes this 0.7999. Even though I wanted to round to the hundredths place, it's going to change it to 0 0.8, which would be, you it could say is 0 0.80 for the hundredths place. But again, you have to kind of fall back to the principle. That's routing it to the hundredths place, but I do not need trailing zeros. They, the Joint Commission and our textbook says, hey, they add confusion. So this is not inaccurate. Because it's a zero, it val it value is nothing. So this doesn't, what I'm saying is that 0.8 or writing 0.80 does not change how much I would draw up in a syringe. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't change it because the zero is nothing. So you are not wrong. You still rounded this to the hundreds place. It's just those 0.99s made you move the 0.7 up. If it was 0.744444, right? they would round down and stay at 0.7, uh, it would just stay at 0.74. So why don't we say that too? Why don't we write that one out and see? I think my next one might be that, but yeah, no. I don't need to write that many fours, but same concept. If I said, hey, now I have this number, round this to the hundredths place. So I look at the hundredths place, it's a four. I look at what's behind it, it's a four, which means if it's less than five, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything, basically. It'd be 0 0.74. If it's, if, it, if it's five, it's gonna change the whole number up. If it's less than five, in this case four, it changes nothing. They drop away and this guy stays the same, if I can not erase him. He stays the same. So that would be 0.74, okay? When, I'm, when it says, I always say rounding down, but I don't want that, to, that term to confuse you, right? You're not changing the four down a number. You're just looking at rounding it, and it just means it has to be five or more for me to make changes. Otherwise, no change happens, and all those extra numbers can just go away. Because they don't really change my value when I'm talking about this, because they're all four or whatever after that. What would be zero? Before. No, it just stays. It doesn't round down, it just stays. It doesn't round away or anything like that. Because all rounding is saying is, did I get to one or the other? If I have a five, it's like leaning me towards that. If I don't have a five, it's just, I'm gonna stay stationary. I'm gonna stay where I'm at, basically. Was it 9.30? Remember slides are left. I feel like this is pretty simple, but let's just talk about it. This is at the very end of the chapter, basically. Because it talks about multiplying, adding decimals. 
I don't need to get into all that because, I mean, you guys are going to have a calculator in your pocket for the most part, everywhere you go. And, I mean, I will say, if you need to add a decimal, the best way, or add or subtract a decimal, the best way to do that is to line them up top to bottom, like however you want to do it, so that you see them all in the right place if you want to do it handwritten. But um, I don't get too far in the weeds. So... This is the last thing we'll do, and then I'll, we'll take a break. And I can, if some people want to run over, we'll take a little longer break just so some people can run over and get their badge. Um, but we will, we will go to 1030 today. We will finish some stuff because there's some other stuff to look at. Um, so if you kind of flip through the book there, it talks about finding a percentage. And that's towards the end of the chapter. It's on page 25. And this is, again, some of this stuff for the early math, I've gotten rid of a lot of it. Um, and this is one that I kind of hang on to just because, again, finding percentages, I just think it's something you should know in general. Um, because, I mean, this is how you find a tip. I mean, I know a lot of receipts do it for us, but this is how you're supposed to find a tip for someone. You take your bill, and you have to figure out what 20% of it is, and that sort of stuff. 20% of 120, how do I figure that out? The easiest way to do this is really simple. This is like, I can cover this in one slide. Whatever percentage it is, move your decimal place over two places. That's it. That's what they were talking about, divide by 100. My decimal place is here. Every whole number in the world, every whole number has an imaginary decimal place behind it, right? It doesn't show up because you don't need it, but every whole number, like, because 20... Or 120 I could, is the same thing as saying decimal, zero, 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 right? That's the same. That's still 120. I just, why would I do that? I don't need that. I get rid of that decimal. I don't need that. But every whole number has a decimal behind it. So my imaginary decimal is here. I want to find out how much 20% of 120 is. I am take this decimal place and move it over to... Now I have 0 0.2 because I don't need this, right? Remember the trailing zero can go away? And I multiply it by the number I'm trying to figure out how much of it is. So 0 0.2 times 120, and that will tell you what 20% of 120 is, which I don't know off the top of my head. Something. I need my calculator. <laughs> I can't think. Uh, 0 0.2 times 120 should be... Is it 25? 24. 24, okay. Huh? Oh, 20%, yeah. No, I'm talking about, you know, if you don't have a 20%, you know, I guess I didn't realize the phones had percentage. Okay, yeah, yes, you could do that, but. But point, if I change any, any, any um, percentage, if I move my decimal place over to the left two places, I now turn it into a decimal. And then my next step is just multiply it by whatever number it was. So 0.2 of 120 we said is 24. So that basically it's saying that 24 is 20% 20 of 120. So theoretically for a $120 bill, that waiter or waitress is supposed to get 24 bucks as a tip. 